Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Well, while the ungodly world seems to be riding straight into hell like a black stallion with its tail on fire, we are wrapping up our survey of the book of Acts. The final two chapters. And as always, the Holy Spirit has been leading Paul. So before we begin, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your leading, your guiding, your directing, your comforting us through your word and through the Holy Spirit. We just give you all the, the glory, the honor, and the praise. Filter out all of that which is not of you, that which is foolish and carnal, but seal to our hearts the truth of thy word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. As we come to the close of the book of Acts, Paul, one of the greatest things that I believe that stands out that should not escape our notice is the fact that Paul wants to know the charges against him. If you've been following us and studying along with us, you know, or you should know by now, that the charges that have been brought against Paul have no merit. I would like for you to keep that in mind as we go through these final two chapters. Paul leaves on a, a freighter, a cargo ship uh, bound for Rome to make an appeal to Caesar. A great storm arose. It was about 60 A.D., I believe, the, the Apostle Paul was en route to Rome and uh, boarding this Alexandrian grain freighter on the Isle of Crete, a, uh, a fierce nor'easter blew the ship off course. I can personally uh, testify to how great those storms are in that area of the, of the Mediterranean, or just the Mediterranean in general, having uh, been aboard uh, a Navy ship uh, back in the 70s, where I spent 153 consecutive days at sea So I kind of have somewhat of an experience, uh, you know, firsthand of, of what those storms are like. This nor'easter, it blew the ship off course and it looked like all was lost. And I'd like for you to keep that in mind as we look at these final two chapters in the book of Acts. I know there was a time in my own life, most likely in yours as well, that, well, it's just that there was a time where I, our lives went off course once, and, and it looked as if all was lost. The text tells us that on the, the 14th night, that they were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when the, the sailors sensed land approaching. They, uh, they took soundings. And they found that the land was uh, 120 foot deep, or the water was 120 foot deep. They took soundings again, 
and they found out it was 90 foot deep and then and being afraid that they'd be dashed against the rocks the sailors they dropped four anchors from the stern and they prayed for daylight and when daylight came they didn't recognize the land but they saw a, uh, a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground. So cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea. Archaeology, archaeologists have discovered one of those anchors. Uh, the actual uh, location of the shipwreck uh, was, concern, was confirmed. And with that storm still raging, the, the ship st strikes a sandbar. It begins to break apart. And with the vessel and, and her cargo, the total loss, uh, the nearly 300 men on board, they, they swam for their lives. And miraculously, everyone survived. And once they were safely on shore, they found out that the island was called Malta. Today, it just happens to be uh, the most religious nation in Europe. 98% uh, of its citizens are members of the Catholic Church. St. Paul is memorialized throughout the island. They throw their cargo overboard in an effort to lighten the ship. They, they, they were at 14, uh, 14 days they were at sea with no food. Uh, they finally, they ate all that they could and then threw the rest overboard. Uh, none were going to die. Paul wasn't going to die. None of the sailors, none of those passengers aboard the ship were going to die. Not one were going to die. How did Paul know that? Well, uh, verse 23, for just last night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And look, God has granted you the lives of all who sail with you. Now they, they thought that they hit the northern tip of Africa. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the ship landed on God's Island. Uh, Malta it was just south of the tip of Italy. If you, if you know anything about the Mediterranean, you've got the tip, tip of Africa, the northern tip of Africa here, you've got the Mediterranean here, and then you've got the southern tip of Italy with Malta below, below, the, below Italy, not far from Italy. It was near Rome where God intended for them, for Paul to go. And this happened through a storm. We know, well, we know who controls the weather. In, in such a great storm, and I, I know it's probably maybe a little too early in the video to start making applications here, but I can't help but, but see in all of this that, that God controls the weather. Uh, he controls our lives. He directs and guides our lives. He, he knows where we're going. He knows he has a purpose in, in what we go through. Uh, it may appear at times that all is lost when we know it's not. But every single person aboard that ship, I believe, was not only delivered, saved from the storm, I actually have reasons to believe that every single person on that ship was redeemed. 
all of the passengers, the crew, prisoners, all were likely redeemed. It was a long trip. It uh, about the, began about the third week of October, uh, lasted until, uh, I guess, close to the end of February. I'd like for you to try to imagine the ministry that must have took place on board during that three, three and a half months that they were at sea. So they all make it to land safely. Uh, they're welcomed uh, by the residents of Malta. The, they weren't Hebrew speaking, uh, Greek speaking, but they, but they uh, were very hospitable. They welcomed them and, and helped them. Uh, and as many of you know, Paul is bit by a viper. The island people uh, thought that he was cursed. They actually sit around for a long time waiting for him to die. Surely this, this person's going to die. Well, he doesn't die. So, well, now he must be a god. This is a... So we're looking at a contrast here between, you know, true spirituality and pagan religion. Paul had... Uh, one of the islanders there had brought his father to Paul to be healed. Uh, this resulted in many coming to Paul to be healed. This was a time in which God was still performing signs, miracles in order to confirm his message and to confirm the messenger. Paul calls for the Jews after some time had passed uh, and they come and Paul wants to know the charges. Keep in mind, Paul is a Roman citizen with rights as a Roman citizen. Paul proclaims the gospel to them. God did this. This is what God did. Never once in our, in our entire survey of Acts have we ever seen anything equivalent to the modern version of presenting the gospel in the sense of, of an invite, inviting people to do something in order to be redeemed. This is crucially important. The text simply says, those who were His heard and believed. Some of them hear, the text says, some of them don't. Same is true today. There arose a dispute among the Jews concerning many of the things that Paul had said, particularly concerning them being dull of hearing and God turning His attention to the Gentiles and bringing salvation to the Gentiles. As I pointed out through several of these videos on this survey, this we're looking at a, a period, a transition period, a period of transition, you know, from Judaism to Christianity, uh, the beginning of the church, the early history of the church. Even though Paul was bound as a prisoner, you know, restricted as a prisoner. He really wasn't too restricted. Uh, it was an amazing time, I believe, to, to freely preach, and that's what Paul did. Try, if you can, to imagine the results of that. And uh, so ends Luke's pen uh, uh, with the book of Acts. We know 
from the text. I mean, it abruptly ends without any resolution to the uh, Paul's ap appeal to Caesar, but we uh, we know that Paul was likely set free or the uh, because if he wasn't, then we have somewhat of a problem because the epistles could not have been written. Some were written from prison, but but 13 epistles were written. Nero likely regretted freeing Paul. Uh, he would eventually execute him. He had him killed, uh, likely following the great fire in 64, which he likely set, most scholars believe, and uh, which he blamed on Christians. And this is how our survey, this is how our, the book, this is how the book of Acts ends. I sat around for, I have sat around for days asking myself, okay, uh, so what? Uh, what is it that God would have us see in these final closing chapters of Acts? Uh, back years and years ago, I was, I was taught that, you know, well, if you can't tell me how or if you can't tell me why, don't tell me what. Dearly beloved, we have to see this as more than just a history lesson. As real as this was, and it, and it did happen nearly 2,000 years ago, it's an historical account of, of things that actually happened that God recorded for our benefit. We need to stop and ask ourselves, what is the message that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey? What is God really telling us here? Why does He want us to know what we're reading in these final two chapters? It's, you know, it's a shipwreck. They, they get washed ashore. Uh, you know, uh, And so I've spent some time sitting around thinking about that. Why did God want us to know this? If you take the time to, to read the final two chapters, I think that you would have to come to the conclusion that God is in control of everything and that He doesn't need our help. He's in control. It's, it's all about His will, His plan, His purpose. And there's an, there's an overall, the, the bigger picture of God's redemptive plan at work here. God is working. God is working in the lives of His people. In bringing about this transition in the way that He designed it, decreed it as these uh, two sailors who were supposedly uh, putting out an anchor uh, decided to escape the ship, to escape their circumstances, in which God said through Paul and to them that all men would be saved, but, but they decide that they don't really like the, their predicament and they want to get out of it. They, they think that they can do better on their own. They, can, they basically are saying that we, can we need to deliver ourselves here. Think about that. You know, they try to escape the wreck by lowering a lifeboat. The ropes get cut. Paul says, if, if they go on, out on their own, we'll all perish. We've got to all stick together. And we'll be saved. We'll be delivered. Dearly beloved, we cannot, as we approach the end, end of Acts, we cannot look at this picture without seeing that the, the, the message here that we cannot deliver ourselves. 
but it's it's more than that. It's sure it, salvation is of the Lord. It truly is. We do not deliver ourselves, dearly beloved. We are the delivered. We are not the deliverer. But in the arena of modern Christian thought today, it's 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 typically accepted that we we kind of hold the final trump card, so to speak. That we are, in essence, in the final analysis, we are our own deliverer. And nothing could be further from the truth. God does not need our help. Uzzah tried to help God, you know, in the carrying of the ark. And he's struck dead. Now, do I believe Uzzah went to hell? No, I, I do not believe Uzzah went to hell. But God used Uzzah as an example to teach us that God does not need our help. Not in the thought, thoughts, uh, the planning of what God has decreed or designed will come to pass. And the results of true ministry includes suffering for His sake. You can't tell me that these passengers and sailors and all the prisoners, everyone on board, were not in a predicament in which it was out of their control. They could not control the winds. They could not control their destination. They couldn't control one aspect of their deliverance in God delivering them from this terrible storm. You know, Moses striking the rock once was a, a symbol of Christ dying only once. You know, not twice or repeatedly. First Corinthians, when we went through that, that marvelous epistle, we, we, we saw that it taught that the rock in the desert was intended by God to be a picture of His Son, Jesus Christ. When, when God instructed Moses to strike the rock in Exodus 17, He intended to establish a picture of Christ as our Redeemer. The Bible says repeatedly in Psalms and Isaiah that Christ is our rock, that He's our cornerstone, struck, killed, that is, killed for our sake. And that as a result, He'll bring forth streams of living water that is salvation. When we come to the book of Hebrews, we, we learn that Christ died once for all and no, no further sacrifice for sins is required. So the Lord intended Moses strike the rock in the desert only once in, in, in the scene of... of Exodus 17, uh, that picture Jesus sacrificed once to bring us salvation. Uh, later on in Numbers chapter 20, the Lord instructed uh, Moses to, to only speak to the rock to preserve the picture created in Exodus 17. And when Moses chose to strike the rock a second time instead, he disrupted the picture created in Exodus 17. Had God allowed Moses' mistake to go unchallenged, He'd have likely, uh, well, he'd, we would likely be confused by the distorted picture. You know, we'd probably conclude that it was necessary for Christ, that is the rock, to be sacrificed or struck repeatedly for our salvation. You know, like every time someone accepts Christ, Christ must die again. He didn't really die once for all, which is the message of the Gospel. I know this is a short conclusion to the, this marvelous study through uh, this marvelous book, but in closing, 
I've got to tell you folks, these final chapters are more than just a marvelous revelation of God uh, that, you know, He's there with us in the worst of storms. I mean, that, that's a pretty, pretty obvious one here, you know. Uh, directing His people, delivering His people, comforting them through great trials. You know, there's the bigger picture, his, you know, his overall plan of redemption at work here. God is willing. God is directing. God is, is driving. God is guiding. God is working in the lives of His people to deliver them. Just like the picture in, of Israel wandering in the wilderness, feeding them, sheltering them, guiding them, instructing them, comforting them. We have to see in the conclusion of Acts that, that Christ loves us. That He loves His people. That He suffered for us. That we might all live not a single soul aboard that ship perished, folks. That Christianity suffered for you and for me. You know, you gotta love Paul. You gotta love Luke. I'm sure that they would have loved us. Or, well, I was going to say, you know, they, they, they would have loved us. They did love us. Paul loves you and me. So did Luke. That we suffer. I, I must show him, God said concerning Paul, what great things he must suffer for my sake. Was, was that, is that just Paul? Or does that not include all of us? Suffer. Why? Because of the message that we preach. Because we are not of the world religious system. We're not of, like those, even those hospitable natives of, of the island of Malta who accepted our brethren who were shipwrecked and cared for them. That we suffer for the sake of the good news of what Christ did and that that produces fruit in our lives and that that glorifies our God It's difficult not to see from our text that in these, especially in these few final closing chapters, that God wants us to trust Him. Why? Because He's our deliverer. Don't miss seeing at the end of Luke's pen that there is no charge that can be laid on the elect children of God. No charge. Worthy of merit. I've had a great time studying through Acts with you all. I hope and I pray that, that you've benefited from this, that you've come to see the love of God in your life. His guidance and His direction through the great difficulties of life, the great storms of life that you've learned that, that we cannot deliver ourselves. That God has our best in mind no matter what we go through. That we have no possible way of, of really 
comprehending the work that God is doing through us in the lives of others. I love you all. I truly do. I don't know where Blessed Hope Forever is going to go from here. We'll be praying about it, thinking about it. But until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.